Blender 4 has finally been released in beta. The official release will be out later in November. And it's bringing a lot of small changes, but a lot of them will really improve how you work in Blender. So here is a quick overview of everything new in Blender and what it does. First, notice the awesome splash screen. And now we'll get into features. Okay. Um, first off, you'll see they, they changed the font that's everywhere. It's slightly different. I don't know if you remember the old one, but now it is a different font. When you, for example, use the measure tool, you'll notice that if you're using snapping, the little symbols for snapping have been changed. Now you see we get a square when we're snapping to a vertex, triangle, or a little hourglass. So that's super exciting. Um, the snapping menu itself has been updated, and you see face project and align rotation to target settings are there for every single option which will be very convenient and you can also exclude non-selectable objects which means you can exclude things from snapping which will also be extremely helpful for some of us next we have navigating while transforming for example i'm scaling this object and i want to navigate my scene well now you can hold down option and navigate as normal while you're still scaling without completing the operation you hold down option and you can navigate i am holding down option right now you just can't see because my screencast keys at home broke if you go to preferences, you'll see that there's now full language support for Catalan as well as the other five that have already been here. So if you speak Catalan, you'll be very happy. Um, we've got a new option up here for saving. You can do save incremental. And when I do that, now if I go see what that did, you see that it just saves my uh, blend file, but with just a one and then a two and then a three, it'll just increment the number every time you save it. So you can do this to save a bunch of versions of a project while you're working on it. Like I could do a bunch of work and then save incremental and then do some more work to save incremental. And then I could just go back to any of those versions I want. Like I could go back to working on this one or this one with the work saved from that point, which is very useful for maybe a client work or something where that stuff matters. Uh, they took away, if you have an armature, you'll see they took away the bone layers and now they're bone collections. And you can assign bones to collections, remove from collections, I don't do much rigging, so I'm not going to pretend to understand this and explain it to you, but bone layers are gone now. Here, our add modifier menu has been changed. It is no longer a huge mess. It is a simple set of menus. Very easy to find what you're looking for, if you remember which category it's in, and if not, you can simply search by typing. You don't even have to click on search. So, also, if you have a node asset, uh, which, you know, you would mark a node group as an asset, you'd have it in your asset browser, that kind of thing, add it in an asset library somewhere or in the current file, and then here in the modifier, you can see all of your node assets are now modifiers. So I have an asset, I'll show you over here. Asset browser. I have set up in the current file, I've set up a node asset in a catalog called dangerous. I've set up a node group called destroy the cube. I made that over here in geometry nodes. And now in, I press add modifier and you'll see dangerous shows up as a category. So I can just go dangerous, destroy the cube and yay, destroy the cube. All right, so that is the new modifier menu, and another one is very small, but very awesome. If I go to sculpting, actually, let's get a sphere. All right, get a sphere, change its move, go to sculpting. Um, you will notice if we will go turn on Din Topo, which is normal so far, but then when you go here, there's no longer, you don't have to check a smooth shading box. It's just by default, smooth shading just stays. No, no need to worry about trying to keep smooth shading on. It just stays automatically, which is super fun because that gets annoying. Let's start talking about nodes. We've got a few updates here, some in the shader editor, some in compositing, some in geometry nodes. First up is the principal BSDF. You'll notice that it looks little and squatty now. That's because it is. They've actually added a few options and condensed a few, but the big update here is that nodes can now have panels like any menu. And in the panel, you can have you know, group settings together by type, which is very convenient because most of the time we're not going to use subsurface or something, and you just leave it out of the way and not have to worry about it. A few of the updates they've made in here is subsurface now. You don't have to set the color. It just uses your base color. I believe they changed specular to include anisotropic, I think. Um, transmission strength or whatever. Transmission is now weight. Um, a lot of them say weight. The weight is the strength of the coat effect or the transmission or whatever, because the transmission is not a slider anymore, it is the label of the section. So don't get confused by that. Um, they changed clear coat to be called coat, 
and now it is above emission, which means they've said that you can ha now have a emissive surface with a clear coat, which we'll try in a minute as an experiment. One of the other new things we got is the Voronoi texture now has detail, roughness, and lacunarity, which gives us control over multiple layers of Voronoi noise. So you can turn the detail, but add more layers of noise, and like branching off from each other, and roughness will change how much each one, uh, there it says it, the influence of a Voronoi layer relative to that of the previous layer. It'll change how much each one influences the next. And lacunarity is the scale of each one to the next. So um, the higher this is, the kind of messier it should be. Connect it up and see. You see it's already very, 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 very cool. Much better than the old one. You can see the scale gets until you have dust. So this will probably it'll always get more detail as it lower. And then if I adjust the roughness, it's revealing hiding more detail kind of. And then the detail is just how many layers there are. It's kind of limitless. Like it's not defining exact layers, it just progresses the noise more the more detail you add. So yeah, the Voronoi texture looks like it's going to be a lot more powerful now. We can already do things like, I don't know, make grunge and things with it that we couldn't do before. So get ready to make all kinds of fun effects with that. And now let's try the emission. The rumors are true. The emission works with clear coat, which is fun. If you're making a computer screen or something, I imagine this would work well. And next we've got some compositing. I can't show you any of the new viewport compositing features, which are terribly exciting. But I can't use view viewport compositing here on my Mac. I think it is not supported. So the main update here is, or the coolest update, maybe not the main update, is the Kuhara node, which lets you turn any image into kind of a painting. It gives a painterly effect. So here is a ghostly hallway. And with Kuhara, it's going to take a very long time to load. Still waiting. Now you can see it has transformed it into these little brush strokes or blotches of color. So it's almost like a painting. Of a ghostly hallway, which is a super neat effect. I'm not sure what I'm going to use it for yet, but, but yeah, if you're into the painterly things and like, things like that, you'll probably find this quite handy. And you can change here the size. If I turn it up more, it'll take kill my computer. It'll take forever to process. And you also have this anisotropic mode, which I have no idea what's different about that. Oh, it'll think it looks like it'll do it along like a direction, so it probably gives you some control. There we go, eccentricity. Okay, so that gives you more customizability for turning your renders into blotchy paintings. And you'll see here that I have now got a node preview. Uh, in the compositor, that's a new thing. You can click this little dot and see a preview on the node, or at least the ones that support it. Yeah, so if I click this, I can turn off the previews, all of them, or I can turn it back on. It looks like when they have that icon, they get a preview. If the compositing was finished, it would probably let me enable it. So like, maybe let's try another node, which is another one of the updates, by the way, is when you press Shift A to add a node, Shift A, you can just start typing to search. You don't actually need to. Uh, you don't have to press Shift A and then click here. Just do Shift A and then start typing. I'll just do it now. So I'm not sure which nodes get previews, but ah, uh, here we go. Mixed nodes get them. Okay, so m I think most nodes will. All the ones that matter will get a node preview button. So that's the compositing updates. This is kind of a big one. We get first thing up is the repeat input and output. So I, to get this repeat section here, I just hit Shift A and. I have to repeat with the new search, and it's a repeat zone, that's what it's called. Okay, so in the repeat zone, it'll repeat anything in there for the specified number of times, which means you don't have to chain together a bunch of node groups to get something to happen over and over again. You can simply put it in a repeat zone and adjust the iterations. All I'm doing here is setting the position, offsetting it with a random number, so I can turn this down. And you'll see that it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse with each iteration. And you can do a lot of fun things with this, probably. For example, I could add a value. Now when I turn it up, it gets offset more and by a different in a different direction because it's totally random. But it's kind of like a small simulation zone that you have control of. So you can do anything you want with that. If you're a programmer, it's affordable. Make fractals and things like that if you put attributes in here and keep them each time around. Like I could put in a scale and reference that every time. But that's too complicated for this tutorial. Okay, now if I shade this smooth, it'll look horrible. But you know, just a demonstration. Set shade smooth. Okay, there it is, that's beautiful. Um, but now we have a selection, so I can only shade part of the mesh smooth. Could be really useful, and you can go by edge or face. That is now an option if you ever just needed to shade part of a procedural mesh smooth or flat. If you use simulation nodes a lot, you'll be happy to see that you can now bake simulations individually. So if I do simulation zone,
Okay, um, after testing, I have determined that this is a difficult feature to access. For some reason, I cannot get it to work. However, they did say it would work, so maybe it's not in this version I've got. Maybe it's going to be released when the official release comes out. Or maybe I'm just doing it wrong, so feel free to let me know about that. Okay, now for the other big deal in Geometry Nodes, let's, which is Node Tools. So that is, in your Geometry Nodes, you can open up a node network. Uh, let's see, I'll go in here. And go to the, you can change your button, there's a new context switcher, and you switch from modifier to tool. And now you're editing a node tool. It doesn't need to be in a modifier anymore. I'm not sure how you get there without adding a modifier. Maybe I can just switch the context. That's probably how. Okay, so in here, I have just set up a set position, the random value, and an amount to control the random value, and also this new node, selection. So in a node tool is something you can access from the viewport as a regular operator. And selection will give you the currently selected faces, or vertices, or whatever selected. And you've also got uh, nodes for, I uh, actually don't know where to find them, but I'm not sure what category they're in, but I can also get select. I can get the selection, I can get the 3D cursor, I can get the, these are only available in the tool context, but you can get selection 3D cursor, you can get skull mode face sets, and you can even set the selection. Like, I could set my selection when I'm done to be everything, or something like that. Now, how to use these is you tab into any mode on your object, and then I'll make a selection, those vertices, and then press this is the node tools button right there, and you'll see there I've got my tool. So I click that, and it applies the operation to the selected vertices as planned. And then here in the settings, I have got a little slider to adjust my property that I exposed in here, which is awesome. Now I feel like a real developer without having to develop anything. So yeah, that is super useful. And I'm not sure, I guess this set selection didn't do anything. I probably need to input a selection. And then we'll set the selection to that, which doesn't change anything, of course. Actually it did. Select. I see it selected everything. Okay, so yeah, this node does work. I'm happy to report. Okay, um, that's it for nodes, I believe. We've got the repeat, bake individual simulations, node tools. This is gonna be extremely powerful. People will be able to make and distribute all kinds of tools and we won't have to worry about the nodes anymore because all you have to do is use them like a tool. So that will be very fun to see. And let's talk about some rendering. First up is something called AGX. AGX is a new view transform. Um, it's instead of the default, which is currently filmic, and it is going to make things look more realistic. Right now, you can see right here, these are some really bright emissive uh, shaders on this spaceship. They turned up really bright. And the thing is, this is still a really dark red, and so it's heavily saturated uh, lights, which makes it look uh, a little bit unrealistic because in real life, they would get brighter and closer to white as the light got brighter. Only they're not doing that here. So, AGX solves that problem and probably a bunch of other problems I'm not aware of. So we see that I change that. Now, this is properly bright, and that's darker. Everything else is darker since there's bright lights here. It's acting more like a real camera would. See how these areas are lighter? Well, when, since these are bright, these are perceived as darker when using AGX, like that. So that's a lot more realistic. And you can see it affects it. Like if I switch to EV, it's horrifically bright, but switching to AGX, is far more realistic as you would expect. You would expect to see behavior more like this in real life, where the bright spots become really bright and everything else kind of dims down a little bit. And anything illuminated is also bright. Compare filmic, AGX. AGX clearly is the winner. It's much improved. Anything involving colored lighting seems to be mostly what it has fixed. Reflected lighting and bounce lighting seems to actually help a lot too. So yeah, that's the new default. I don't think you'll have to worry about it unless you open up an old scene like this one, which is why I had to switch it. So for anything new you make, it should be set as the default. Next up is light linking, which lets you make it a light, only light up a certain object. So here's the boringest possible scene. We've got two cubes here. And over here, this is a green light. As you can see, it is lighting everything up green. Over here, this is the red light, making everything red. I want the green light to only affect this cube. I don't want the green getting on this one. It's ruining my scene. So to fix that, all I do is select the light here, and you see here we can add in new light linking uh, collections. So I'm just going to select my object. I want this object and this light to be linked. This object, I'll just hit M and move it to a new collection called red. Okay, so now this, oh, sorry, I want that to be green. Name this collection green. Okay, so now everything in this collection will be affected by the green light. 
Oh yes, green. Just choose the green collection. See, so yeah, now the green light is only shining on objects in the green collection, which is kind of cool. That's how you link lights. You can also link shadows with this shadow linking thing. Okay, so I'm going to shadow link this. Um, move this to a new collection. Shadow green. And yes, I know my naming conventions are not anything proper and they're not even consistent. Okay, so on this light here and shadow linking, I'll just grab shadow green. Now, only this should be able to cast shadows for that light. We see that it is doing that. Since it's in the proper collection, it is casting a shadow. I think this is how this works, which looks weird as you can tell because of the red light. It is casting shadows. This, this can block it, but if I were to add a new mesh, a cube, you'll see that it is not, it's not casting a shadow. It is casting no shadow on this cube. That's because it is not shadow linked and only this is allowed to cast shadows. So if I move this to the shadow green collection, suddenly it can cast shadows. So that's the power of light and shadow linking. You can use this to like have rim light on your model, not mess up anything else in the scene. You can have lights, individual lights for every character in a scene. Anything can be lit now without messing up the lighting for anything else. And you even have control of the shadows. Okay, so those are the major render updates. It's probably something I'm forgetting, but I don't know what. Let's move on to the video sequence editor. The main update here is retiming, which means you can animate retiming the speed of a clip. So I've got this clip here. It is just looking around at this big wall. And then to retime it, we select the strip and we press Control R, like you're making edge loops, which opens up this little keyframe here, which is the retime editor. So I can drag this keyframe and just speed up the whole strip. So now you can see it plays through really fast. But if I undo that, I can also add new keyframes in here. You can add keyframes in here by hitting I. So I'll go right here and hit I. I add retiming key. Uh, you can click and drag your keyframes to change uh, the speed. So if I drag this way, it's going to start really fast and then slow down. Okay, and if you want to smooth the transition between these speeds, for example, I'm going to go from that to that, but with smooth transition, you can right click on here and add a speed transition. And you change the duration of it. Is an option. And then you can also add freeze frames now. If I just right click here and I'll add, no, nope, right click, add freeze. Uh, Blender crashed, so maybe avoid adding freeze frames for now, but in the final version, they'll probably have that bug fixed. Um, it just, add, when you right click, you get add a freeze frame, which it, you get to customize the length of it. The speed is just set to zero for that part, which uh, is great for uh, freeze frames. It's much easier now. Okay, uh, now you're up to speed on everything that's new in Blender 4. You can go down now at blender.org and enjoy blending.